another edition of Thunderdome. This happens to be Unit 4 Review, which is Chapter 5 for us. So let's go through it. Um, so, uh, learning. Well, we have a definition up here, obviously. Um, what I have seen the most on an AP Psych exam is this question that deals with what perspective kind of goes with learning. And that perspective is behavioral, okay? Uh, where we solely look at observable behaviors um, and we kind of gauge what causes that behavior to happen. Um, that is really what's being studied when we study learning, uh, is behaviorism. Uh, and you'll see that. Um, so our definition of learning, the process that produces a relatively enduring change in behavior or knowledge <clears throat> Uh, as a result of past experience. Um, so, two types that we're going to go over at first, and then there's this last type called observational learning. Um, so we have classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Classical conditioning is literally pairing two stimuli, so things in the environment, together to elicit the same response. One of them is probably going to be reflexive, meaning that you do this naturally as a human. You know, if you smell food, you would salivate, just like a dog, all right? We don't drool out of, out of our mouths, unless you're a baby. Um, but, you know, that, that's a reflexive response. And then what we pair with that uh, is going to be that conditioned, um, you know, stimulus. So that usually, like I said before, it could be time of day. Um, so, classical conditioning, pairing two stimuli together to elicit the same response. And then, operant conditioning is really based on consequences. And this is like where we learn so much. Uh, because we either get rewarded or punished uh, for certain ways that we behave. Which would in, you know, turn cause an increase or decrease in the likelihood of that behavior happening again. So that's what operant conditioning is. So let's go through it. Um, Pavlov won the Nobel Prize in 1904. Uh, he drilled holes in dogs' mouths and uh, collected saliva from those dogs <clears throat> in response to a little experiment that he was uh, doing to kind of look at digestion. Um, so he wasn't a psychologist, he was a physiologist. Uh, and um, he found one of the, I mean, this is a crazy discovery. All right, that this is how people gain uh, or acquire a new behavior. Um, you know, not only people, but um, pretty much all species. So, um, what did he do? Uh, he did this experiment with the dogs where he took a neutral stimulus, okay? So, a neutral stimulus is something that just elicits attention. It's the bell, it's me clapping, it's me snapping. Um, it means nothing to you, but it gets your attention, right? So he takes a neutral stimulus and he ends up pairing it with an unconditional stimulus. So an unconditional stimulus is that thing I was talk talking about that is just reflexive, it's natural for you. Okay, so um, you know the, the natural stimulus that reflexively elicits a response without the need for prior learning. This is ingrained in us, biologic. All right, and so you take the unconditioned stimulus uh, and we know that the unconditioned stimulus always has an unconditioned response, meaning that it is unlearned, it is reflexive, so that's the UCR. And then we take the conditioned stimulus, which is previously known as the neutral stimulus, and we pair it with the unconditioned stimulus, the food. So the meat powder and the bell get paired together for a very long time. This is called the acquisition phase. And we are learning in this moment. And then all of a sudden we take away the thing that is reflexive. So we take away the meat powder, the food, and then we're just ringing the bell. And then what happens? Every time the bell rings, we drool. It is pairing two stimuli together to elicit the same response. If you can understand that the response is always going to be the same thing, you're a step ahead. Okay? Um, so that's classical conditioning, if you see something that has an example and you see answers like UCS, UCR, CS, and CR, um, you know, take a moment 
and kind of pick out the parts of that and apply it to Pavlov's experiment, and you're probably going to get it right. Because Pavlov's experiment is pretty easy to understand in that type of realm. And then if you can see what we're talking about, you know, if you can take, you know, if it's Aunt Edna, and uh, you love Aunt Edna, and Aunt Edna wears perfume, and then all of a sudden you smell the perfume and you feel love, you can actually take that and look at it through the lens of Pavlov's experiment and probably get the right answer, okay? So the UCS in that would be on Edna. The UCR is love, right? Because I naturally love my aunt or whatever. Auntie, Auntie Edna. And then what's paired with it? The other stimuli, it smells nice, perfume, and then the same response happens. When I smell the perfume, boom, love. If you can somehow you know, figure that kind of stuff out, just by comparing it to Pavlov's experiment, you're gonna do well. Um, if you're a visual learner, check this out. Uh, might make a little bit more sense to you. Um, so Pavlov discovered stimulus uh, generalization and stimulus discrimination. Generalization is best you know, explained by this example. I was bit by a large dog, now I'm scared of all dogs. So I was bit by a large dog, but I have generalized my fear into all dogs, okay? And then stimulus discrimination is the exact opposite of that. I was bit by a spider, and I'm scared of spiders, not all bugs, okay? So, pretty easy. Um, higher order conditioning is pretty much whenever uh, you don't know, that um, classical conditioning has taken place. You could figure it out you know, through one thing and the other, which would be both the UCS and the CS. But let's say, and you're just looking at this image right here, you have the uh, can opener and the food, they're paired together, they're gonna both elicit uh, drooling from the cat, but the can opener is actually in a squeaky door, uh, a squeaky cabinet door, so every time the squeaky cabinet door opens, the cat hears it, understands the can opener is coming out, and then the food. That's higher order conditioning. I can't tell you what has happened to you in this type of situation. This has happened to you. I know that you don't realize it. It's kind of an unconscious thing, but this has happened. Um, somehow, some way to you, you have learned this way with higher order conditioning. Uh, one of the examples that I've given before is this girl named Laura. Uh, Laura goes to the doctor as a toddler. She gets a shot. The doctor is wearing a white lab coat. She is super scared afterwards. She's crying. Um, you know, it's an intense thing for her. Um, her mom goes to the store, not the store, the mall, and they're walking through the mall, and then all of a sudden there's a uh, cosmetic saleswoman with perfume. She's also wearing a white lab coat smock type thing. Um, and Laura is a little bit fearful of that. And then tss, tss, this person sprays the mother, probably without asking. And um, then all of a sudden, you know, if Laura, for some reason, next time she smells that perfume, is scared, higher order conditioning has happened. And it might not be as intense as the original, but. If it's just there, just a little bit, it has happened. Um, okay, acquisition we talked about. That's uh, both stimuli, right, uh, being paired together. Uh, so that is the learning phase. We're actually learning. Now, here's something that happens when you take away the unconditioned stimulus, which in Pavlov's experiment would be the food, the meat powder. So you take that away, and all of a sudden, it's just the bell. The bell loses its flavor after a, a while. The, the dog will not drool because the bell is just there. It needs the food to be there, you know, not, not continuously, but at least every once in a while for it to continue to be a learned response. So extinction happens whenever the UCS is taken away and it's just the bell, it's just the conditioned stimulus. Uh, and then all of a sudden it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and then it goes away. And then something happens where later on, all of a sudden the dog hears a bell, randomly, and then spontaneous recovery. Which means pretty much that we just start drooling 
after we've lost the learned response because we kind of remember that we did this thing once. Okay? Um, we'll talk about extinction and operant conditioning here in a little bit where we can get people to stop acting certain ways because we don't reinforce it anymore. Um, all right, this is uh, John B. Watson. You know him as the little Albert guy, right? He did what Pavlov did, except he did it to a baby, and it was considered unethical, but not as unethical as apparently his affair. He had an affair, and he could not get a job in academia afterwards, and he went into advertising, and he really kicked off this modern age of advertising that we experience today, where ads actually try to make you feel a certain thing, like fear, rage, or love, and they use that against you for you, know, you to buy the product. Um, one of the greatest quotes uh, that you know, he's come up with is this right here. I should like to go one step further now and say, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, in my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Doctor, lawyer, artist, merchant chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief. Regardless of his talents, pensions, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors, I'm going beyond my facts and I admit it. But so have the advocates of the contrary, and they have been doing it for many thousands of years. This guy hated structuralism and functionalism. He thought that it wasn't based in science, and he's right. It was based on in, you know, introspection and subjective experiences. Um, and he is solely there to observe behaviors because it's the only thing that actually um, was objective, right? Um, so uh, again, little Albert experiment. Here's some nightmare fuel for you. That hammer picture really gets me. Um, so yeah, here's the story about uh, you know the advertising world. Two examples here: baby powder and toothpaste. So he created doubt in the mother of caring for the baby. In the, baby, in the baby powder ads, basically saying, are you a good mother? You are if you use baby powder. And then toothpaste, do you want to die alone? Then don't use toothpaste. Because you're going to die alone with smoke-stained teeth if you don't use toothpaste. Basically creating this feeling that, um, you know, in young women that they're inadequate if they have smoke-stained teeth. Um, Examples of classical, classical conditioning, uh, you know, I use cologne and perfume a lot uh, to uh, make that example. Uh, coffee in the morning, again, you kind of have this thing, uh, the placebo effect is real, right? Like when I smell coffee, I begin to wake up more. That's just how it is. There's no coffee in my bloodstream, right? And once coffee gets in my bloodstream, it actually takes 20 minutes. So, you know, that's the placebo response, placebo effect. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, reliable signals. In classical conditioning, um, you can only truly learn if the signal is reliable. If it's unreliable, you don't trust it. And so the learned behavior doesn't come along because you never really know if it's gonna happen or not. So it has to be consistent, it has to be reliable. So this guy, Robert Rascorla, did an experiment with rats on reliable signals. Lots of R's. That's how I remember what Robert Rascorla did. Okay? So if you see Robert Rascorla and it asked, you know, he you know, goes, he did an experiment with rats and blah, blah, blah. The answer is going to be reliable signal. Okay? Um, now, if for some reason it you know, goes in the direction of... Uh, that the rats didn't learn, then the answer would probably be unreliable signal, okay? So to, in order to learn, the signal has to be reliable. It has to be consistent. Uh, taste aversion, uh, this guy John Garcia, um, he com comes up with this uh, interesting thing that, you know, is real. You learn by classical conditioning, but acquisition is a one-time deal. You know, I ate Taco Bell, I got sick, I threw up and I never ate Taco Bell again. That is taste aversion. That's also known as one trial learning, one time learning. Um, where it was so intense that you don't have to go through this acquisition phase. It was just like, okay, that was too much and I'm never going to do that again. All right. 
Um, biological preparedness, this is Martin Seligman. He basically s says that we are biologically uh, you know, predisposed to feel certain things about certain stimuli. And he goes into kind of like what we're naturally scared of as humans. Um, so we're biologically, we're ingrained with this. Um, again, 200,000 years of evolution and uh, the things that have killed us the most, snakes, heights, spiders, um, you know, bad storms, all that kind of stuff. So those are like real things that we are biologically predisposed to be scared of. Um, so uh, classical conditioning and evolutionary aspects. Uh, all right, operant conditioning, this deals solely with consequences, so reinforcement and punishment, getting uh, rewarded uh, or you know having some sort of you know punitive consequence. Um, so operant conditioning, the basic learning process that involves changing the probability that a response will be repeated by manipulating the consequences of that response. So let's look at this. The first guy to actually even talk about this is this guy named Edward Thorndike. He comes up with this thing called the law of effect and this is so true and you know that this is true. When things have a satisfying effect, it increases the likelihood of you doing that thing again. If it made you feel good, you're like, you know what? I want to do that again. All right? And if it makes you feel bad, the opposite happens. You try to stay away from it. Okay? And so that's the law of effect and that is pretty much what operant conditioning is built upon. The guy who built upon it is B.F. Skinner. He looks like a weird character that would take over the world. Um, he comes up with a Skinner box, and we'll look at that here in a second. Uh, but he comes up with a term called operant. So this is a, a term for an actively emitted, which we would, we would call that a choice. Uh, so actively emitted or voluntary behavior that operates on the environment to produce consequences. So if you want to do well on the AP exam, the operant would be studying, right? You manipulate that to get the particular consequence that you want. Um, so again, Skinner doesn't believe you ever, you've ever made a choice in your entire life. He is a behaviorist, and he basically says that everything that's ever happened to you is because of the things that have already happened to you. Okay? Really hard to, to uh, disprove that. Uh, all right, reinforcement. Uh, the occurrence of a stimulus or event following a response that increases the likelihood of a response being repeated. So there's two types of reinforcers for a human. The primary reinforcers would be um, anything on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, bottom level, right? Anything that's going to keep you alive. That is a primary reinforcer for a human. But how do we get those things? Secondary reinforcers, okay? Um, so, I mean, money money's the best example right there, you know. So, uh, secondary reinforcers also could be called conditioned reinforcers, so just kind of pay attention to that. Make sure that you don't get confused by it. Uh, all right, positive reinforcement. Let's get it out of the way one more time. Positive does not mean good. It means addition. We are adding something. So positive reinforcement, a situation in which a response is followed by the addition of a reinforcing stimulus, increasing the likelihood that the response will be repeated in similar situations. Um, you know, praise. You know, monetar monetary compensation, a bonus at work. Um, extra credit points. Uh, anything that is added to the situation to increase the likelihood of you doing a particular behavior again. That is positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement. This isn't bad. This is good. Negative means taking away, right? To subtract, the removal of, avoidance of, escape from. My favorite example here is the uh, Mom driving the minivan, right? And I'm in the back seat. I'm seven years old, little Travis, you know. And Miley Cyrus comes on the radio, 
And, uh, you know, it's party in the USA. Mom's feeling it. I say, Mom, turn this off! That's how I used to talk when I was seven. Fresh, <laughs> fresh from West Virginia. And uh, she says, excuse me? And I say, Mom, will you please turn this off? And then she says, okay. And she turns it off. She is reinforcing a particular behavior. Good manners. Asking nicely. Saying please. And how did she reinforce that? She took something away. Miley Cyrus. She turns the channel. That is negative reinforcement. Okay? So there's some examples here that you see. Um, so avoidance behavior and escape behavior. Um, those should end up being pretty obvious if they ask you about it. Um, you know, I think you know what both of those words mean, escape and avoidance. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, da, 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 da. all right, here's comparing positive and negative reinforcement using two, uh, an example of making the dean's list. All right, punishment, um, you know, I just, I like to think of two types of punishment just to clear it up in my head, spanking and being grounded, okay? Uh, so, uh, the presentation of a stimulus or event following a behavior that acts to decrease the likelihood of the behavior being repeated. So punishment by application is also known as positive punishment. Obviously, if we thought about it as being good, positive, the word positive, and uh, it'd be good punishment, that doesn't make sense. So, you know, punishment by uh, uh, application. Um, so this is spanking, all right? We're adding something in to decrease the likelihood that you're gonna do this behavior again. Um, I was spanked as a kid. Um, you know, more or less for lying more than anything else. And that's why I'm the most truthful person you've ever met. Parents are so proud. Um, so then we have punishment by removal, which is negative punishment, so we're taking something away. And this is being grounded. You snuck out of the house, you come back, you get your keys taken away, you get your phone taken away, you get your privileges taken away. That is punishment by removal, negative punishment. Something has been taken away to decrease the likelihood that you are going to do that behavior again. Um, alternatives to punishment. Honestly, punishment kind of sucks, and it actually is pretty short-lived. Um, you can learn by it, okay, uh, but the better avenue to go down would be to reinforce the correct behavior, okay? So you almost don't punish them, you don't punish them, you actually explain what the correct behavior is, and then maybe walk them through it, or say, you know, do that again. Um, you know, next time, why don't you call me? Next time, why don't 